RPGs set outside the usual fantasy settings are a bit of a rarity, and so a game set in 1918 London where you play as a doctor turned vampire who has to wrestle with both his morality and bloodlust is, at the very least, an interesting premise. Don't Not Entertainment's Vampire definitely succeeds at nailing some parts of the quintessential vampire experience, but it also has a lot of problems. It can best be summarised as enjoyable but inconsistent. It's a game full of ambition, dripping in style and with a fantastic atmosphere, but it also has a lot of obvious issues that hold it back. It's a game with lots of great ideas, but those same ideas often have very mixed execution. It's a game worth your time, but maybe not worth your money, at least at the current price. It's a game that's sometimes easy to love, and sometimes easy to hate. I want to explain exactly what this game does and doesn't get right, but before that there is one question that I think needs addressing. It's been many years since Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines whet the appetites of vampire and RPG fans alike and the years of hoping and waiting for some kind of sequel or successor can't have been an easy thing for fans to endure. So when a new vampire-focused RPG was announced, it's understandable that a lot of hungry Bloodlines fans set their sights and hopes on Vampyr as maybe being what they've spent years hoping for. And that gave Vampyr some pretty big shoes to fill. Perhaps from that point onwards disappointment was inevitable, and maybe Don't Nod didn't do enough to dispel comparisons, and so the rumour of a spiritual successor to Bloodlines finally being on the way persisted, and here we are. The answer to the question that so many people have asked and continue to ask, is this game like Bloodlines, is no, it's nothing like it. If that's disappointing then I'm sorry, and I understand why you may feel that way. Bloodlines may have deserved a sequel, World of Darkness may have been underrepresented in video games, and the selection of vampire games in general may have been pretty poor. But if you expected Vampire to be similar to Bloodlines, you probably should have known better. And if you bought the game on that basis and were then disappointed, you really only have yourself to blame. The developers never said it was going to be like Bloodlines. Game footage didn't look or sound like it would be. The setting and tone are so obviously not alike. There are no connections to World of Darkness lore, and I could go on. The similarity is that they're vampire focused RPGs, and that's about it. But I guess that alone was enough to lead to comparisons, and I suppose it shouldn't be that surprising as, for some reason, there haven't been any other vampire RPGs. Vampire games seem to have been rare in recent years, despite the fact there seems to be both a market for them and plenty of opportunities for them to provide interesting game mechanics or morally ambiguous stories. Vampire seeks to take advantage of all these things, embracing the typical vampire tropes with total commitment and using the dilemma of whether and who to kill as its main selling point. And the result is a game that is, despite all of its flaws, interesting. Before going any further, let me quickly talk about spoilers. This video won't have any major spoilers, but it will have some minor ones. These include some of the NPC backstories, as well as explaining the first big choice in the game and its outcome. Examples used in this video will mostly come from the first half of the game, and this video shouldn't spoil the game for someone who hasn't played it. But what is a spoiler and what counts as a major spoiler are pretty subjective, and if you really don't want anything spoiled then you may not want to watch this before playing the game yourself. And finally, I'm not sure exactly what the correct pronunciation of the title is. I think it's actually Vampire, and Vampire is just the French pronunciation. Despite that I chose to pronounce the title as Vampire, as sometimes it can make what I'm referring to easier to understand, and I think the extra clarity is worth it. With that said, let's look at the story and setting of Vampire. In many ways, the opening of the game will tell you everything you need to know about what kind of story this is. As far as vampire stories go, this is one that takes itself very seriously. It's not at all tongue-in-cheek, nor is it trying to subvert the classic vampire mythos or anything like that. Instead, it's thoroughly bleak and dark and often very deliberately dramatic. Sometimes to the point where it can come across as overly dramatic, with some parts falling a little flat as a result. At times it can even feel a bit ridiculous, but there's still something endearing about how serious the game takes itself, and it often succeeds at being entertaining even if occasionally it's for the wrong reasons. When religion failed, men turned to science. I saw them build such vain cities, crafting machines made for endless war. New questions flourished as old answers withered. What is darkness but lurking sun? What is war but enslaved stone? What is glass but 
tortured sand. Okay, they were pushing the luck already with some of the earlier lines, but what is glass but tortured sand? I guess this line must have sounded better in French, because it sounds like the kind of bad poetry you'd find scribbled in a 13 year old's diary, who's just going through a phase where no one understands him, and if he ever looked back at what he'd wrote later, he'd wondered how he could write something so shit. Not that I speak from personal experience or anything, definitely not. But it's the very first scene, and it's immediately difficult to take this story seriously after hearing a line like that. Moving on from the over-the-top monologue that almost feels like parody, you find yourself coming to in the suitably ghastly location of a mass grave after having already died and now reawoken. After a brief section of slowly walking forward in a straight line, a modern video game intro classic apparently, you find a woman who seems quite pleased to see you. And then you waste no time sinking your teeth into her throat and draining the life from her body. And as colour returns to the world and our protagonist regains his mental function and you realise this innocent woman Mary. is, of course, your sister. No. Oops. Mary. No time to mourn though as you're then shot at and chased through the street by a group of armed assailants. This is a nightmare! Not quite, but there is a tutorial section ahead so I guess that observation isn't far off. Hey, I'm sure I've confused the two before on occasion too. Soon you'll begin cutting your way through the first of many nameless goons, with the apparent ease that only a video game main character can manage. Accidentally killing your sister and then being hunted like some out of control beast, or being forced to slaughter yourself a path to safety must be quite a lot to go through. Sorry. But at least our protagonist still finds the time to say sorry after each person he kills, so I guess he's not taking it that badly. After a brief run in with some pesky sunlight, you find a place to hole up that conveniently has a gun cue an obligatory war flashback as you pick it up, and then I guess our protagonist isn't taking it all so well, as he lies back on the bed, points the gun at his heart, and then the game waits for you to pull the trigger. Rational thinking. And as the drops of blood transition to the title screen, you have to admit, it's an entertaining opening. Yes, the writing can be hammy, yes, everything can feel a little cliché, and a little too dramatic, but it's an enjoyable introduction to our vampire story that all happens pretty quickly. This is a story where if you stop and think about it, you can easily find flaws, but if you just sit back and enjoy the ride, this is a fun vampire tale that, despite being over the top, kind of gets away with it in most occasions, and it does so for a few reasons. Firstly, there's the soundtrack. The entire soundtrack is great in Vampire, with a lot of very atmospheric pieces that really give the game a dark and gothic feeling. But it's the way the game uses music to add to and complement the drama that's most impressive. It uses these heavy cello pieces, as well as some great choir sections, and the result can be fantastic. Every time something dramatic is happening on screen, the soundtrack is there to absolutely carry the scene, which makes it very easy to ignore any problems in the writing or story. Slowly, vampire! Who are you? I, I mean you no harm. Say it, the vampire! Present yourself! I... I need a word. Anyone. Vampire really does do a great job when it comes to atmosphere, even if it isn't the most graphically impressive game of the year. London feels gloomy and authentic, and the inside of abandoned buildings can be very detailed and ominous. The morgue is a good example of showing this early in the game. 
it's surprisingly creepy on your first trip through. Some story moments are very nicely directed, and the effect, when combined with the soundtrack, is great. Vampire may lack in technical prowess and visual polish, but it sure has style. The voice acting is also great. For how many voiced NPCs there are in the game, the level of quality for voice acting in general is really high. The real standout performance is our main character, the doctor turned vampire Jonathan Reed. It helps his voice actor just has a very easy to listen to voice that is pleasing to the ears even after hours of dialogue. Good evening, miss. I'm Dr. Reed, the new surgeon at the Pembroke Hospital. And who are you? I wish this guy would read me bedtime stories each night. Even when the writing can be a bit weak, his performance remains strong and it helps keep the story convincing. And Jonathan is a likeable main character. It's worth clarifying that this is a predefined character. You have some choice in dialogue, which I'll talk more about later. But you don't choose Jonathan's personality at all. He is his own character and he's always written in a certain way. And for some RPG fans, this may be off-putting and diminish the role-playing aspect of the game. Still, he's an enjoyable protagonist, and he doesn't feel like your usual video game or action movie hero. I don't think he ever makes any quips or out-of-place sarcastic remarks. Nor does he have that always present nonchalance in the face of danger attitude. Instead, he's written as an upstanding early 20th century gentleman who is always well-mannered and sincere. Despite this, he doesn't come across as a pushover. He'll confidently stand up for his beliefs or scold others for wrongdoings. And he never lets himself get talked down to, giving his character strength and making him easy to respect. It all works thanks to the good casting for the voice actor and the fact his character is so consistently earnest about everything. I can't believe I'm doing this. This is despicable. Jonathan, stop your whining and eat your rats up like a good little vampire. All in all, he's easy to become attached to, and it makes you invested in the story even when the story itself may struggle to do so. However, as Jonathan is his own character, some people may miss the freedom that comes with a player-created character, and if you don't enjoy his personality, that might be a problem. I know there were times when I wanted to act differently to how Jonathan does. And also there were a few small things about him that annoyed me. Like how he makes so many comments about being an atheist and how belief in God is silly despite the fact he seems to have a pretty big reaction to crosses. There's also a problem with playing as evil, as Jonathan's personality doesn't change, and that means he still acts very moral in many scenes. The only big change in him is his eyes, which is also weird. Am I supposed to believe that no NPCs notice this? It's one thing when they were just extremely bloodshot, but by this point, come on, how can no one comment on them? The final thing that helps the story is vampires, and I mean that in the simplest way. Vampires are fun. As there haven't been many recent vampire games, it makes a good vampire story easy to enjoy. Things that should be cliché, like the existence of an exclusive vampire club that secretly runs the country, instead become enjoyable tropes. What's more, Vampire isn't a modern take on vampires, like certain other examples of recent years. Instead it has that classic gothic horror feel and that's something which is great to be able to play through. It's always seemed strange to me that there aren't more games where you play as a vampire, and maybe standards have just become low, but on some level Vampire's overly serious and reasonably authentic vampire story just feels satisfying. There are some problems with the game's storyline towards the end of the game however. It gets a little convoluted, and it also feels like there are too many long explanations for plot points. During the epilogue you find a reasonably lengthy book to read that provides backstory, just before talking to one NPC who basically repeats the book's contents along with some other things you already know, just worded differently. And then you speak to another NPC who repeats many things for a third time. The game could have said just as much with fewer words, while reducing the amount of boring exposition dumps the player has to listen to. I also think the game reveals too much of its mythology, and it's a mythology that isn't particularly interesting. More mystery could have been better. The ending in general is pretty weak, both in terms of story and storytelling, and that's a shame, but there are still plenty of enjoyable moments leading up to it. 
Alongside the main story, Vampyr features 64 unique NPCs. Speaking to these NPCs and uncovering their stories will take up a big part of the 25 hours or so you'll spend on a single playthrough of the game. As far as the NPCs go, they're okay. You'll find some who are interesting and likeable, some who are successfully unlikable, and some who are realistically boring. Some of the things you find out can be surprising. Some characters that may seem like assholes can become more sympathetic. Some characters have some pretty dark secrets. And some of those boring characters might end up at least a little less boring. Vampyr doesn't do a bad job at fleshing out these NPCs, but these characters don't just exist for the sake of telling their stories. They're in the game to provide choice. Choice is Vampyr's greatest strength and biggest failure. Vampyr marketed itself as being about choosing who to kill as a vampire, while also stressing the fact that you can complete the game by killing no named NPCs. However, taking the lives of others is your main way of accumulating XP, and so this choice is tied heavily to the difficulty of the game, with taking no lives intended to be challenging. Each life you take can have unintended consequences, leading to the loss of side quests or information about other NPCs as well as prompting other NPCs to either die, become an enemy, or just react in some other way. Killing NPCs can also provide you with new weapons, open up new dialogue options with other characters, and affect the overall safety level of their district. And the consequences of taking a life can be a great part of Vampyr. To give you a couple examples from characters you can kill early on, if you kill poor scarred Thomas, then his friend, the remarkably likeable Thelma, who has delusions of herself being a vampire, then goes missing, and you can find her in the streets being harassed by vampire hunters, with a new side quest opening up to save her. Completing that can get her back to the safety of the hospital, but be prepared for some guilt still. And I'm glad to meet you too, mortal. I see things much more clearly since I escaped those hunters, and that includes you, Jonathan. Another example is killing the young, depressed Harry Peterson. Upon killing him, things don't seem too bad as you receive a new gun that was presumably left to him by his father to be used in self-defense. So However, when you next rest, you'll find his father, Joe, has gone missing. If you return to their house, you'll find a clue as to where he's went in the form of a vampire hunter recruitment flyer. A few hours later, I came across Joe in the streets as a hostile enemy. The consequences are interesting, not just in making you feel guilty, but also in terms of gameplay. By killing the low XP Harry, I lost out on the higher XP of Joe as a result. And so even if you wish the player is evil, you can still be punished for your lack of patience or greed. If you kill too many and neglect the health of other NPCs, an entire district can go nuclear, making the entire place hostile and killing every NPC left without one bit of XP going your way. The small details connected to your choices help too. The amount of new dialogue options that open up for characters in the same social circle is impressive, and you can even find gravestones of those you killed at the cemetery. So the consequences of killing are really well done. Who to kill does become a good question, and it's clear the game was designed to try and make that question interesting. To get the most XP out of each character, you'll need to uncover hints about their backstory. I'm not sure what the lore explanation is for that, but I don't care too much as it's a good idea. By connecting their XP reward with their backstory, you're forced to get to know them. This may make you attached in ways you maybe didn't expect to, or make you have second thoughts on whether that arsehole really does deserve to be sucked dry when you know the tragedy in their past. But it also might make you more sure of your decision. Not everyone is made to be sympathetic, and there are some real pieces of shit who you could even argue killing might make the world a better place. You also learn to be smart about who you kill, You'll soon realise characters without a social circle are unlikely to have negative effects on other individual NPCs. And after making your first district go hostile, you'll probably be paying much more attention to the other district's well-being in the future. And of course I have to mention the process of killing itself. It may be simplistic from a gameplay perspective. You just need a high enough level of mesmerise for that NPC, and then you just walk them to the nearest out of sight area. But the execution is fantastic. It's something you want to see at least once. I've never felt more like a vampire than in these moments leading up to and following killing someone in this game. Part of me wanted to kill every single character just to hear their final words. Killing in this game is just so satisfying. 
This system isn't perfect. It would be nice if different NPCs had different consequences on the district's safety level, rather than all NPCs being equal. This could make the consequences even deeper, and reward you for killing unimportant characters while maybe punishing the player for killing someone who is morally bad but still serves an important role in the functioning of the community. For example, killing a gang leader could cause a rise in chaos as gang warfare increases, while killing a mass murderer could increase safety levels slightly as mysterious disappearances decrease in the area. A short newspaper article could be added to communicate this to the player, like what already exists for the bigger story choices. Still, giving the player a choice of who to kill and connecting the XP reward to how well you know them is a great idea, and the effort put into this system and its consequences is really commendable. However, a lot of people won't experience any of this, and here is the big problem. The game was marketed as having the option to kill no one, but if you do this, Vampire isn't anywhere near as interesting, and several things just don't work. And I'm not talking about difficulty, although I'll get to that later. Firstly, the appeal of this game is largely having choice, but if, after making that very first choice, should I kill people or not, you then choose not to kill anyone, most of the choice in Vampire is gone. When you meet each NPC, you don't ask yourself each time, should I kill them? What will the consequences of this be? Is it worth it? You've already decided you won't kill them because you're not going to kill anyone. Lots of people will play Vampire this way, including me on my first playthrough. The game was marketed in a way so as to make this sound appealing. A lot of people like to play as a good character, and the way it was talked about made it sound like a fun challenge. It's also the only way to get the best ending. It just makes sense that lots of people will go for a no-kill playthrough. And it's what I did, even though I wanted to kill people. I never wanted to play as a good vampire, that sounded boring to me. However, I did, just because I wanted the challenge. Because I didn't want to risk reducing the difficulty, and because I wanted to see how this heavily talked about option would play out. And, not only does a no-kill playthrough remove most of the choice in the game, but also many things about NPCs are just made pointless. Take the hints that you uncover to learn their backstory. These give you more XP when you kill them, but that's all they do. So a big part of the game has no reward when you don't kill anyone. Sometimes it can be interesting to learn about the characters just because their stories are worth finding out. But there's 64 NPCs and they're really not that interesting. Long before the end of your playthrough, speaking to them will feel boring. And finding out all information about them is completely meaningless from a gameplay perspective. You get no XP reward, and the whole point seems to be that you use the information you find out to determine if you should kill them. There's nothing else you can do with these hints you learn except sometimes use them to gain more hints. And sometimes it feels like there should be something you should do in some scenarios. Some of the things you learn seem to be things that need some kind of action, and there are no alternatives than killing people. For example, you learn that one character is a mass murderer, or that one parent is abusing their child, or that a wife is poisoning her husband, and then you just do nothing, because you're a good guy? It's jarring. There are serious crimes you find out, and you can't even report them to the police or confront other related characters about what you learn. In general, there are no resolutions for anything, and it's deeply unsatisfying, with a few examples feeling like they desperately need some option to do something about what you learn. Although, on the other hand, Outside of the worst examples involving serious crimes, there is something realistic about how certain issues are represented in Vampire. Video games can often trivialise serious problems in the way they allow the protagonist to meet people and almost instantly solve their deep personal issues through one shallow side quest or a few encouraging words in a conversation. The truth is, things like PTSD, depression or child abuse aren't easy things to solve and the way a game may allow you to fix them so casually can be completely unrealistic and maybe even slightly irresponsible. Representation in video games is a term thrown around a lot, sometimes about some pretty trivial things. But I think representation of mental health problems is important, and there is a side to it not always considered. Often, focus on representation is on the need for greater representation through more inclusion of certain things or topics, but realism is also important. Reducing complex mental health problems to just being easily solvable side quests may not always be helpful. So in some ways I think it's a good thing Vampire doesn't do this and doesn't allow you to solve every character's problems. 
However, certain examples call for action without giving you any non-lethal way to act, which is a problem. And learning about characters just for the sake of learning about them is no way near enough of a reason when it comes to this many characters. There has to be some kind of point to it, or reward, beyond maybe increasing Jonathan's capacity for small talk as he makes his rounds or something. So, not killing NPCs removes most elements of choice from the game, provides no resolution to important things you learn, and makes the system of gaining hints pointless from a gameplay perspective. Vampire is simply not as good when you don't kill people. And that leads you to wondering why it was designed this way. If they knew they wanted to make not killing NPCs viable, and then advertised it heavily, why didn't they make that fun and satisfying? Perhaps the game would have been better if it was designed to force you to kill. It's a big part of the vampire experience, and there is something boring about the concept of a vampire who never kills anyway. Why didn't they just embrace the notion that vampires are inherently evil creatures, and make the moral dilemma not be about whether you're a good or evil vampire, but instead focus more on that middle ground? As a vampire you have to kill to survive, but it's up to you whether you resist that temptation as much as possible, while only carefully killing the deserving for your own sustenance, or give in to your dark side and kill for power or pleasure. The concept of a pacifist playthrough doesn't work very well anyway, as the game forces you to kill vampire hunters by the hundreds, and, while killing in self-defense is different I suppose, vampire hunters still aren't evil. I mean most vampires clearly need hunting, so the whole idea of being a pacifist vampire is diminished by the gameplay that has you killing people and sucking their blood, regardless of whether you also do or don't kill named NPCs. As far as choice and consequences outside of killing NPCs, it mostly comes down to four big story choices that each correspond to the fate of one NPC who is labelled as a pillar of the community. The first of these choices is executed very poorly. I'm going to spoil what happens, but it's quite an early event in the game and you may even be grateful to have it spoiled because the result can be pretty bullshit. So in the questline you're investigating who is blackmailing Lady Ashbury, a vampire and benefactor of the hospital. This leads to discovering how one nurse, Dorothy Crane, is responsible for the blackmailing, but is doing so in an attempt to help the poor rundown district of Whitechapel. After you've confronted her about this, you're given a choice that you can see now. If you choose to charm her, she'll die after you leave, which you might find pretty surprising. No explanation is given for why this kills her unless you return and ask other NPCs, where one will tell you that after you left, apparently, you made her brain damaged, and I guess that must have made her easy prey for some vampire or something. The problem is, there's no reason to know this could happen. Blue text indicates that Jonathan uses his mind persuasion power, and there is one document you can find earlier in Dr. Swansea's office that talks of the dangers of mind controlling people. But this is something you do non-stop in the game. Literally, every time you talk about an uncovered hint, or when you want to give someone medicine, you use your mind control power to influence them, as shown through the same blue text. You can't even give medicine to someone without doing this. There's no reason to make the connection that this could be a negative thing. This choice with Dorothy Crane is also a dialogue option that you only unlock for uncovering all hints about her, furthering the implication that this is a good option. And the actual good option is worded in quite a negative way. It says force her to resign, but I didn't want to force her to resign, Surely we need all the nurses we can get right now with the epidemic. So the option to charm her and make her forget about the blackmailing seems to be the best option. Instead, it's the worst option, as you don't even get any XP from her. You can return later to find her as a hostile Skarl, which is like a lesser vampire, but you don't get anything from it. And by the way, that fight is pretty bullshit. I did the entire thing without being hit once, and then when she dies she erupts into a cloud of poisonous gas that I hadn't seen before at that point, and which was unavoidable without knowing about it beforehand, and it drained my entire health. So thanks for that extra fuck you, I really appreciated it. The whole game uses an autosave only system, that therefore makes it impossible to load a previous save. This is something I don't usually do with choices in RPGs, even if their consequences are bad. But after seeing the results of this choice, I really wished I could, as I felt like I'd been unfairly misled. Unexpected negative consequences can be a great thing, but I think they have to be communicated more fairly than this. Different wording would have been all that's needed to let players know that charming her 
is different from what you do non-stop throughout the game, and could therefore go wrong. It really felt frustrating at the time, and I've seen lots of other people complain about it for the same reason. I also didn't know if this would lock me out of the best ending for letting an NPC die, or if it was just a matter of time before the entire district was destroyed as a result. It really left a bad impression for me at the time, although as I kept playing I soon got over it. In the end it's really just one NPC dying, and Dorothy Crane did annoy me at times anyway. Finally you've returned Doctor! Did you find anything of value? For God's sake, Dorothy, wash your bloody hands. They've been like that for days now. Employing vampires is one thing, but does this hospital have no hygiene standards or what? Anyway, future choices are thankfully all handled better. They can also have unexpected negative consequences, but they each feel fairer. The options you have are clearer and sometimes more interesting. One of them in particular is quite memorable if you choose a certain thing, although that's something I wouldn't want to spoil for anyone. These choices also don't mean you get the bad ending, unless you're choosing to embrace these NPCs. And I can respect trying to give interesting choices that aren't obvious. I just wish the first choice you come across was implemented better. The only other choices you come across in game are in dialogue. Dialogue as a whole is not that strong. You get some choice at times, but mostly you're just exhausting each dialogue option for a bit of extra information, before choosing the highlighted one to move on. When you do get choice in what to say, it's marked with a red Y. But these choices don't have much effect, and sometimes they're just three things that mean the same, just worded slightly differently. Sometimes when talking to NPCs, these choices can be tied to hints, and choosing the wrong one will cause a hint failed message, meaning you've permanently lost access to that piece of information. On the one hand, I really like how there is at least some consequences to dialogue choices to make what you choose feel like it matters. On the other hand, it means you can't roleplay conversations the way you want. You mostly fail hints for being rude to people, so you are basically forced to trying to always be nice and respectful, which is a bit boring. Also, thanks to the autosave system, you have no way to load a previous save and try again, which will no doubt bother some people quite a lot when they lose a hint forever. I think Vampyr could do with some more meaningful choice in conversations. In a game with so much dialogue and that calls itself an RPG, Having more options to shape dialogue through player agency could have really helped make dialogue more engaging. Dialogue also has some minor issues with poor flowing conversations that result from the dialogue wheel's implementation, where going from one conversation topic to another can completely change the mood. There's also times where the short options you're presented with can provide too little information, a common problem in games that represent long dialogue lines through shortened versions. Conversations are how you get most hints from PCs, but usually it's just a case of methodically exhausting each dialogue option, which isn't very interesting. You don't actually get to do any detective work or have to try to figure things out for yourself. The game does it all for you, so learning hints isn't very satisfying. The one actual detective thing you do is eavesdropping, which again has some problems. On the one hand it's great, because you do have to pay attention and do some work for yourself to find out hints this way, rather than just having everything handed to you. And when you do find a scene to eavesdrop, you can learn some interesting things, and it feels quite rewarding to have found it yourself. The problem with it is, it's time consuming having to wait around just in case a scene triggers where you can eavesdrop. At one point I knew an NPC had a scene that you can listen in on, and I waited 8 minutes for the scene to start. Maybe there's a way to trigger it faster, I did try different things, but it was pretty boring having to wait 8 whole minutes. And that's when I knew the scene would happen. Unless you always walk around with your vampire vision turned on, it's hard to know that these scenes even exist. I had plenty of hints I never found, and I assume many come from eavesdropping, but it's not worth waiting around every single NPC just in case. I wish they'd put an icon on the hints that come through eavesdropping, so you know which characters to at least pay attention to. Alongside being a part-time vampire detective, you're also a full-time vampire doctor, which is, unfortunately, more boring than it sounds. Being a doctor works well in the story, but the gameplay ramifications are shallow. You can cure NPCs who get sick, and doing so is important to keeping a district healthy. This is much more significant if you're killing people, in which case district health is important to prevent loss of XP from it going hostile, and people seem to get sick a lot more when district health is lower anyway. 
It's still boring though, as all curing NPCs amounts to is a simple task of walking up to the NPC and mind forcing them to take their medicine like a good boy or girl. Considering travelling around this game world gets quite boring already, the need to do so to hand out medicine can just feel like a chore. I was looking forward to being a doctor in Vampire, and I wish there was a bit more to it. It would have been nice to diagnose NPCs. Your vampire vision could show you that they're sick, and then you could ask them what's wrong with them and listen to them explain their symptoms before choosing what to give them. It would obviously still have to be shallow, and it would take up some development resources to implement, but I would have appreciated something more to be added to this part of the game. I want to play as a doctor, not just as a delivery man. So, the story is enjoyable but nothing amazing. Choice and consequences can be interesting, particularly if you do decide to kill NPCs, but they also have some big problems. Options to roleplay are quite limited, whether that's as a vampire, detective or doctor, and while I enjoy the main character, the setting and the premise, I wish more was done with them. So all that's left to talk about then is gameplay. Well, except for technical issues. I think this game is surprisingly polished, at least for what I expected at release. I had some frame rate drops, but not that often, and I don't have the greatest PC. Lots of reviews complained about load times, but they were quick for me, so maybe that's a console only issue. One issue the PC version does have, however, is poor mouse and keyboard support. In general, I encountered very few bugs that had any impact on gameplay just some odd animations, some clipping of clothing, and some twitching of body parts. If there's one place the graphics really let this game down, it's faces. They have poor detail, facial animations are pretty basic, lighting can have weird interactions, and some conversations take place at some really odd angles. The word that sometimes comes to mind to describe faces in this game is Oblivion-esque, which is not a good thing to be reminded of for a modern game. Although it's obviously not that bad. By far the biggest small issue that may be a sign of a lack of polish, or this game's AA budget, is how skipping dialogue lines are handled in conversations. There's a lot of dialogue in this game, and it can get boring. People can read a lot faster than voice lines are read out, and so people may often want to read ahead to save time. If you then press the button to skip a line of dialogue, it will skip to the next character speaking. Any additional dialogue from that character just gets skipped over, so you can't just skip each line that you've read, meaning you basically can't read ahead without losing parts. I guess this is because the audio for a passage of text is in one chunk, even if that piece of text is split up into multiple subtitles, but the result can be really, really annoying. I think the effort it takes to fix this would have been well worth it. When you aren't speaking to NPCs, most of the rest of the time you spend with Vampire will be walking the streets of London and fighting enemies. Fighting enemies can be fun, but there isn't a the depth or variety to make it really memorable or continually enjoyable all the way through the game. Compared to a true action game, Vampire will feel noticeably unresponsive, with movement outside of dodging feeling quite sluggish, and all actions having some delay to account for animations. Combat in Vampire is also not as deliberate as Dark Souls or Bloodborne, where each attack or dodge feels more calculated. Vampire may have a stamina bar, but it gives you enough to dodge around and attack several times before you have to worry about it replenishing. At its most basic level then, combat revolves around dodging away from enemy attacks before retaliating and then dodging away again. Several things make it a bit more complex. Firstly, you have several vampiric abilities at your disposal, that you can unlock with experience points. These include damaging abilities, utility focused abilities and ultimate abilities, although the selection of each of these is quite small. Some of these need a resource, blood, to use, while others are just cooldown based. Using these abilities well is important when fighting against multiple enemies that are higher level than you. You'll also notice enemies have a grey bar underneath their health that can be depleted with certain weapons attacks to cause enemies to be stunned, enabling you to perform a bite attack, which is your primary way of gaining the blood needed to use offensive abilities. Stunning and then biting your enemies is incredibly effective early in the game, particularly if you use the two-handed club that allows good damage as well. For some reason when you bite one enemy, all others will just stand there and watch, which doesn't make much sense to me. I'm sure early 20th century Englishmen were a very well-mannered bunch, but I'm not sure that should go as far as waiting politely for a vampire to finish his meal before they resume attacking him. 
So, biting does good damage, makes you invulnerable, charges your blood, and most importantly, allows for your stamina to recharge. Therefore, it can feel very overpowered as its low risk, high reward. But the further into the game you get, the less broken it seems. It takes more hits to stun high level enemies. And also, after you've bitten an enemy once, the amount of hits needed to stun them a subsequent time is increased. Finding ways to recharge your stamina becomes one of the main ways combat has depth in challenging fights. I found the most effective way to play was to try to use my abilities or biting to allow me to find the time needed for stamina to be recharged. Using abilities well can also be rewarding. For example, when using the slow two-handed club, I found the core ability can be used to utilize its increased speed and greater range to fit in an attack where your normal attack animation isn't quick enough or using the shield ability to deliberately tank enemy hits and save stamina on dodging while preventing your attacks from being interrupted. The combination of managing your blood, stamina and cooldowns, using abilities effectively and keeping track of and dodging against multiple opponents allows combat to have some depth and provide some satisfying fights if you are underleveled. Enemies also have different resistances to melee, range, blood and shadow attacks. With two weapon loadouts you can switch between and four ability slots, this does encourage you to mix up your strategy against different enemies, while paying attention to their resistances to do more damage and finish fights sooner. I always appreciate when a game tries to encourage players to use a range of weapons and abilities like this, rather than just allowing players to rely on the same single strategy every single fight. Unfortunately you don't really have many ways to do some other damage types, particularly blood and shadow damage. At least not when your XP is limited by not killing NPCs, as you can only really afford one offensive ability to put XP into. Lack of experience points also means you won't get to use many of the interesting upgraded abilities. And while these aren't needed to complete the game at all, it does feel a bit boring to miss out on them. You can at least refund your XP to try out different abilities or builds, which is good. But having to respend all of your experience points is time consuming especially if you just wanted to change just one single thing. You can make builds with some synergies, like if you want to use a stunning weapon you may want to upgrade your bite more, or if you want to put a lot of XP into an offensive ability you may want to invest in ways to increase your blood gain, but for an RPG the upgrade system is quite shallow. Having to rest to spend XP can also be annoying. At times I really enjoyed combat, particularly when fighting against groups of higher level enemies. Using all your abilities while dodging against multiple opponents sometimes works great. The biggest problems with combat aren't so much with the combat system itself, but more with the world design leading to repetitiveness. If there is one big difference between an action game and an action RPG, it's pacing. An action game is always finding ways to change things up, to add new twists, to introduce variety and increase the level of challenge. There's a sense of momentum, and if done well, they provide a short, action-packed adventure that keeps you interested from start to finish. An action RPG is usually longer, and instead uses combat to pad the game out, and you'll definitely see this in Vampyr. Moving from one location to another will have you fighting several small groups of enemies, where each fight can feel very similar. Enemies give almost no XP, so killing them can feel pointless, and they're left feeling like obstacles that exist to get in your way as you move from point A to point B. There is some enemy variety in the game, but it feels like it's too little and introduced too late to keep fighting enemies interesting for an entire playthrough. There are several boss fights which can provide some variety, as well as some of the most interesting encounters in Vampyr. A few can be too easy, even on a no-kill playthrough, and if you are killing NPCs, bosses can die in seconds. However, some fights do provide a good challenge, with bosses having different attack patterns and powerful telegraphed attacks, that will force you to pay attention and dodge accordingly. Some boss fights are repeated, but there are still several memorable bosses. I can imagine several people got annoyed with the resistances of the penultimate boss, which I won't show in case some consider it a spoiler, and I don't think I'll need to show it for people to know who I mean. But for me this fight was also the one true challenging fight in the game, and beating him may have been slow but it also felt very satisfying. A lot of what's been said in this video about combat assumes people who want interesting combat either won't kill any NPCs or will only kill a very small number, and so the game will still have some challenge. Fighting on level enemies is very easy. Killing lots of NPCs will make you overleveled and incredibly overpowered, 
allowing you at times to just kill things in one hit. Which can actually feel kinda nice if it's your second playthrough and you don't feel like spending a lot of time in combat. Difficulty is such a subjective topic, which of course makes saying statements like Game should add lots of different difficulty options to cater for different players, obvious. But I think the idea of tying a difficulty setting into a game's morality system is great, even if it doesn't work for all players. Some people will play Vampire and want more XP, and then be forced to think carefully about whether taking someone's life is worth it. I really respect the developers for trying to do something interesting, and it's an idea that fits very well into a Vampire setting. But there are some clear problems, although I don't think that includes something I saw a lot of game journalists mention, which is that the game is too hard when you don't kill NPCs. The thing is, that's the point. That's the morality slash difficulty system working as intended. Either kill someone or deal with the consequences. Even if you don't kill any NPCs, the game is never difficult enough for the challenge to feel frustrating. I think a bigger problem is how not killing NPCs removes a lot of choice offered by the game, but I already talked about that earlier. Difficulty is a bit weird. It can feel incredibly forgiving when you fight badly against on-level enemies. You can basically just spam attack until enemies are dead. Similarly, fighting against high-level enemies can sometimes feel overly punishing when you play well, with some attacks killing you in no time like the poison skulls. The result is the challenge can feel slightly unsatisfying at times. There is level scaling in Vampire 2. It's hard for me to work out how much, even when I've played almost two full playthroughs in polar opposite ways. Scaling seems subtle and is applied unevenly. I've got footage that shows some fights being the same level and some different, so I'm not really sure how it works, but there's definitely some level scaling going on. I guess it's to try to prevent the game getting too easy when you kill people, to try to ensure things never get too unbalanced, but if that's the intention I'm not sure how well it does that. Anyway, the difficulty system may not work so well, but I still love the idea. It's how it limits choice, and how Vampire doesn't feel as interesting when you don't kill NPCs that's the system's real problem. There are some gameplay problems outside of combat though. I like open world games, even now when they seem to be becoming more common and more generic. Part of me is still a fan of the concept for the added immersion they bring. However, if you want to make an open world game, you need to make travelling around that world fun. Travelling around London may be visually interesting, but from a gameplay perspective, it isn't, it's a chore. Having to go past endless filler enemy fights that don't even give XP, trying to navigate streets that manage to feel very maze-like despite often being quite linear, and then you have the encounters with locked gates. It's locked. For a game that isn't very long, travelling around this world gets boring fast. There are times I think fast travelling games is implemented too often and too freely. That said, I wish a fast travel option could be unlocked in Vampire. For example after you get to the West End, or maybe only when travelling to sanitised districts. As it is, having to go from one side of the map to the other and back, just to give some asshole his cold medicine, gets old fast. One thing I also found myself wishing for time and again was an expanded stealth system. Currently you can start a fight by walking up to an enemy unseen, and then stunning and biting them. But that's it, it's very basic. There's no way to take out enemies from stealth one by one, and almost no ways to use the environment or your vampire powers to sneak up on people. You mostly just have to rely on them facing the other way. Allowing more stealth options would have several benefits. It would allow you to travel around the world while avoiding combat, something you might want to do and that could also help prevent combat becoming repetitive. It would also allow you to kill less vampire hunters, which would make playing as a pacifist vampire make more sense. It also feels like a big part of being a vampire is having the ability to kill from the shadows and elude your hunters. Not having that option feels bad. So many times I longed for a way to sneak past enemies or pick them off one by one. It just felt like something Vampire needed. At times I would stand above enemies on a platform, and I guess other games have conditioned me to expect a way through some aerial kill, but having to just jump clumsily down and start fighting normally felt really disappointing. The world almost looks like it should support more stealth options. There is visually a lot of verticality to the streets of London, but only sometimes are you allowed to shadow jump above street level. 
having the ability to lure vampire enemies into vampire hunters would have also been great. Sometimes you'll come across them fighting each other, and sometimes you can lure them into fighting, kinda, but it doesn't work well, and a way to get groups of enemies to fight each other from stealth would have been a good feature. So, of all gameplay additions, an improved stealth system is what I think would most improve the game, and I hope they do try to expand it if there's ever a sequel. The final part of Vampyr's gameplay I've yet to mention is loot. Like other open world games, everywhere you explore you'll find some basic items to pick up. Enemies also drop loot, and seeing as they give so little XP, I guess that this is meant to be the main reward for killing them. Most of what you find is used for a basic upgrade system, but it is just that, basic. There are also shops, although I only ever found a few items in them that were actually useful for upgrades I needed and so there's almost never anything worth buying. Shops feel pretty pointless, and so does looting areas beyond the few times in the game when you get something to upgrade a weapon. But there has to be things to pick up in an open world game. It's just part of the formula at this point. Giving the player things to pick up is done to make exploration feel worthwhile, even if you don't get anything useful. And even when I knew it was pointless, I still rummaged through every bin I saw, and robbed the hospital blind every time I passed through it. I guess years of gaming have made me a virtual kleptomaniac at this point. And if an open world game doesn't give me meaningless things to pick up, I think I'd miss it on some psychological level. But it would have been nice if they were just a bit more useful, and I had something to spend all my scavenged shillings actually on. Vampire has a hell of a lot of problems, but it really does try to do something great. Even if it's not always successful, you have to appreciate the risks it takes. Its most interesting ideas are also where it has its biggest flaws, such as how choice and NPC hints are handled, and there are plenty of other problems beside those. There's also the question of price. A lot of people want AA games to do well. They're an important middle ground that provides more space for experimentation with a higher budget than indie games might be able to provide. The gaming industry needs AA games, but if you want reviewers or consumers to consider your game as being AA, and therefore be more lenient on its shortcomings, you have to have a double A price tag. This game was released at £45, and that's only £5 cheaper than the most expensive newly released titles. I don't think the level of quality that Don't Nod delivered matches the price tag, and if it was £10 less, I think the response would have been much more favourable. I don't know how that would have affected sales and profits, but people do have certain expectations at certain price tags that Vampire may not always satisfy. But I don't regret any of the time I spent with Vampire. A good vampire game is something special, and this game gets the feeling of being a vampire spot on quite often. And there are plenty of enjoyable moments to be had. And while I could have spent even longer going over the flaws in Vampire, because it's undeniable this game has many obvious flaws, I can't say I didn't have fun with the game. And you know, if there's one thing professional reviews can sometimes undervalue, in their attempt to provide an objective, numerical indication of quality. It's fun. This is a fun vampire RPG. And I think for a lot of people, that's enough. This little fucker claimed he'd fallen in love with me. Really? Did you consider accepting his proposal? Well, immortality. Not a common wedding gift, is it? I think he just wanted to have his way with me. Can vampires even fuck, Doctor? What? Um, well, I, 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 I really can't answer that. I, I, well, since they are creatures of blood, um, physically speaking, I suppose, an erection is possible, but I... Hmm. Don't